You're listening to Recovery Survey, the podcast that shatters stigmas around different types of addictions and takes a deep dive into spiritual principles. I find a lot of wisdom that comes from your show. You interview different people and I know you just do an overall good job and you're a blessing to recovery in general. So I want to make that very clear for the record that I love the movement that you have what you're doing. You're saving lives and you're educating and informing people. And I think that's important. I want to thank my friends at Recovery Survey for giving me the opportunity to talk to them about my recovery journey. Thank you for having me on uh, the new podcast that you just developed, which is unbelievable, Recovery Survey Podcast. I really appreciate what you're doing and, and been doing and continue doing. Our guest today is named Jimmy, and he has a YouTube channel called Sex Addicted Christian. He's here today to talk to us about his journey and tell us about the program that he's developed to help break the addiction to sex and pornography. Welcome to the show, Jimmy. Thanks, Brett. Yes, yeah, good to be here. My name is Jimmy Trent. Um, I have uh, recently launched uh, an online ministry, Sex Addicted Christian. At sexaddictedchristian.com. Addicted, sex um, that is uh, just a ministry that I, I've grown to love over the years. It's born out of my own story. And, uh, you know, I, I do professional counseling as, a, as like my day job. And so prior to that, I was in Christian ministry uh, as a pastor and before that with the missions organization crew. Um, and so my wife and I have been kind of in the ministry, Christian ministry for two decades or more. And just over the years, um, with my own story of coming out of uh, the addiction to sex and just continuing to minister to guys and families uh, in this context, I, God finally just pushed me and said, you know, you need to get this going and start speaking specific to this topic. So, yeah, man, that's uh, that's me kind of uh, in a brief, brief summary. If you're comfortable with it, would you mind going into your backstory maybe a little bit and, and letting hundred percent, dude. Awesome. hundred percent. Yeah, that's fine, man. I'm all good. Yeah. I mean, my story, um, with sex starts at age 11, which seems to be pretty common for most guys that I've spoken to. I mean, the first time that they saw pornography, you know, whenever I was growing up, which I'm 43 this year, um, there wasn't cell phones and there wasn't internet and all those things. And so if you were going to see porn, I mean, it was going to be like, you know, Victoria's Secret catalog or, you know, or really it, for me, it was a friend uh, that had found his dad's like Playboy stash. And so one day we were hanging at his house and he took me upstairs. We dug through the closet and in the back was a big big box of playboys and i can still remember the first i mean i still remember who the cover girl was i can remember the image i remember what that image was like and why it hooked me and uh and that's just kind of where it started for me i i didn't i didn't continue looking at pornography again it wasn't accessible at the time but it definitely did something in me that that created a hunger or a desire for that and for me, that's just kind of where it started from there. It just, it kind of goes forward. I was a, I call myself a late bloomer. So I didn't really have girlfriends too much growing up in middle school and high school. I mean, I dated girls, but I was kind of more reserved and didn't really push the boundaries or limits too much in terms of my own, you know, sexuality. Uh, it wasn't until after I graduated from high school that I actually lost my virginity. But the sexual addiction for me just continued. It, 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 built steam over time. It is, I mean, it's, I, some people argue as to whether or not sex can be an addiction or not, but I mean, I see the same kind of things playing out in sexuality um, in terms of tolerance building, more risk taking, you know, you start with something small that becomes not enough. You want something more. And that's kind of how my life went. I, I became more and more risky in my behavior and yeah, dude, I was, I grew up in church, so I, I wasn't in church all the time. I was in and out of church. I, I wouldn't even say I was a Christian, 
Um, although I, I walked an aisle when I was a kid and got a Bible, but that Bible stayed in plastic until way later in my life. Um, it wasn't until 1998 that I actually became a, what I would say became a Christian, converted to Christianity. I was at a church service. Uh, the guy was preaching, you know, kind of typical ev evangelical preaching, saying, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to burn in hell kind of thing. Well, that got me moving. So I, um, I trusted Jesus in 1998, uh, became a Christian. But what was interesting to me is like lots of things changed for me, um, except for this. And that was the thing that was really confusing to me because I, I would say I was a sex addict prior to 1998. That's when I would say I became a Christian. But then after that moment, I like the best way I can think about it now is looking back I would say I went from sex addict to sex addicted Christian. It's a, it, and that's kind of where, where the where this ministry, you know, name came from. It's like I, I feel like my identity was as a sex addict prior, and then my identity shifted into what I would say is most primarily Christian. But sex addict became kind of this adjective that helped describe it in some way because it didn't go away. So it followed me. It was it was just the oddest thing, and I didn't know how to deal with that. The challenging part for me in that, though, was like I felt like in the Christian church for me, and I don't know if this is true or if it's just the way that I assumed it was, but it seems common that you just can't talk about this. And so it seems like sex is such a taboo thing. And um, I think that's changing in a lot of ways, but I'm struggling as this Christian. I'm being told you know, sex before marriage is wrong, you know, pornography is bad, No, don't masturbate, like all these things. And those things are happening in me, not just happening, but they're, but like, I'm addicted to it. Like I can't, it's just a part of the fabric of who I am. And I didn't have any way to get help. At least I didn't think I could. I didn't think I could tell anybody that this was a struggle for me. And, and, later come to find out that's that's what I needed more than anything was to be able to to say it right I needed to be able to tell someone hey I'm in deep trouble over here I need help and instead I just continued to try to fight it myself in secret and uh really just lived it was it was terrible because I'm living this secret life that is taboo in the community that I'm in and that creates like even more shame and that shame I, I've learned has been uh, one of the one of the key factors, at least for sex addiction. I've not battled with drug addiction or alcohol addiction. That's not been my plight. Um, so I can't speak from experience in terms of that. But with sex addiction, and maybe you can tell me what it's like in, in a different category of addiction. But shame is such a key component of keeping an addict addicted. And oftentimes, what I've found is that you know, we feel ashamed for the choices we're making, but the only way we know how to cope with negative feelings or shame specifically is to do the addiction more, which just creates more shame, which then creates more addiction. And there's just this downward spiral. And so, you know, that's, you know, one of the things that I focus on in my ministry to sex addicted Christians is the first thing we want to talk about is the shame and like dealing with the shame of those things. And and it's a it's a really, you know, I, like I said, I sit in the counseling room with people all the time and sometimes I'm hearing someone say things for the first time. And it's such a beautiful moment whenever you're able to, to be in a conversation with someone and they are able to say something that they were scared to say. And then I get a chance to respond to that in a way that helps them really live out a different truth than what they thought it was going to be like. You know, because they thought they were going to get reprimanded or shamed even further for what they're confessing and to be able to say, man, that's tough. Or, yeah, man, I know I've been there or whatever the case is. And it it alleviates it just it speaks so much life in that moment. And so, yeah, the shame is such a big part and has been for me. But that that's a little bit of my story. I mean, there's more to it for sure. I mean, in terms of how this, you know, this was all single Jimmy, you know, and then of course it wasn't until after I got married that I even, what I would say, came clean with my addiction. And so, you know, that was, that's a whole crazy story in of itself, having to, 
bring all these secrets to my wife five years into our marriage. And so she had no idea. Um, and that was a, that was just a, a crushing season. That's the place where I, I began, what I would say is began to walk in freedom. That was 10, 2010, 2011. Well, I, th- I think you hit the nail on the head when you were talking about just that continuing spiral of, of shame. And then that shame leading to that same destructive behavior that we have and, and just that vicious cycle. You know, I think, you know, from, from my perspective as, as a recovering drug addict, uh, a lot of it was isolation and that isolation was like you were talking about due to the shame of what I was doing. And then the only way that I knew to numb that pain of, of the shame and, and the guilt and, and all those feelings was to then use again. And it just continued this spiral of self-destruction. Yeah, man, you, you hit it right on the head. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. So like, uh, and it's, it's beautiful what you're saying. Like you brought in a whole nother theme, right? So we're talking about shame, but then you brought another category into this of isolation, which, you know, we would say maybe the iso- the isolation is the opposite of community. And so it's like, to me, that's the building blocks, right? Like if we can't, if we can't come to some kind of uh, resolution around the shame of what we're doing, then we'll never have the courage to step into community, right? So you remain isolated. So to me, that's like, I mean, you're, you're teeing it up for me, right? I mean, I, like I was telling you before, like the, the four pill, what I have is the four pillars of the porn free life, just this guide checklist guide free to, to download. Crushing the shame is pillar one, cultivating community is pillar two. So those two things, I, it's almost impossible to do two if you don't do one, right? Like you've got to be able to remedy the shame in order to, to be willing to risk your story to someone else. Those two things are just so closely connected. That's why they go, I mean, they go in that order for me because the shame piece becomes the, you know, it's the wall that stands between you and another person. And I've seen that. I mean, it's, that's what's, that, you know, I did 12 step stuff early on. So I, I was a lot of different recovery things that I did. Um, I mean, I did some like weekend, like inpatient stuff with around sex addiction. I joined a 12 step program, Sexaholics Anonymous. I joined, uh, you know, some spinoff community thing of the inpatient thing that I did, or, I mean, it was just like one thing I'm is reading books. It just, I just kept taking in as much as I could, but that was one of the beautiful things about going to a 12 step program was like, I could go in there and I didn't feel judged, you know, <laughs> like I could step into a community and I mean, there's lots of rules around it. And and I had, I mean, there were things I took issue with in terms of the 12 step program, but, but I would never look down on it because it was such a life-saving part. I mean, of my recovery was being able to walk into a place where I knew that there were other guys that were going to say, I know, (laughs) you know, and it was just such a good spot, man. It was so good and refreshing to be able to say the things that were so scary to say, you know, know that it was okay. It was okay to say those things. And that was going to help me, right? Because I needed to get out, you know, I, I don't know if this was a 12 step thing, like in the big book or, or not, but there was, there's just a phrase that for me, whenever I was, walking through recovery in those early phases was I I always said, get out of my head and into the light as fast as I can. And so it's just like when that, those temptations came, I couldn't stay in myself, right? I had to make a call. I had to text somebody because as soon as I, as soon as I texted or as soon as I made a phone call, I don't know where you're at in the U S but in Florida, we've got roaches and that's like a common thing down here. I used to think, because I grew up in North Carolina, I used to think roaches were like only if you didn't wash your house or clean the dishes or something. But in Florida, they just like, they, they've they taken over the state. So you got to like have like a whole armory force to keep, the, keep those things out of here. But you don't know they're in your house until it's nighttime. And then you go into a room and you like turn the light on in the garage or something. And there'll be like a roach in the middle of the garage. And as soon as you turn the light on, though, that thing shoots off to find the darkness. That's to me what community, that community aspect provides is like being able to say, hey, I'm tempted right now to do this, to look at that, to 
partake in this or whatever the case is. And when I say it, it's almost, it almost like that temptation runs just like that roach does, right? It just like, it goes and finds a hiding place. It gets out of, it, it hates the light. Like our addiction hates the light, dude. That's the truth. Like it hates the light. And when I say the light, like, I mean, exposing it, like it being out there, but you can't do that if you're, if you're living in shame. And I don't know, man, I don't know. I don't know about the, the guys and gals listening here, man, but like, we've got to be able to overcome that. We've got to be willing to say like, man, I, I need help. I need to talk to somebody, right? I've got to be willing to risk whatever it is that I fear is going to happen. If I were to say this to them, (laughs) you know, if I told them about it, we've got to be willing and able to risk that because the community is like essential to recovery. It's essential. I mean, I'm sure people have recovered with no community. I mean, I, I mean, look, it's not perfect. I'm not saying, you know, I don't claim to have the like corner on the market of recovery for sure. But it seems to me that stories of recovery include friendships, right? Closeness with others. So anyway, yeah, that's uh, some thought there. But I'm with you, man. Shame and isolation. And you brought up another good point about the community. I think it's important to have that community because you're with people that are struggling with similar things. And so like you were talking about, there's not as much fear in sharing what you're going through because those other people have been in those same kind of situations. So they're not going to be as judgmental. So that community is really important. And like you were talking about, uh, you know, like in the program I'm in, we talk about it all the time. Like if you're thinking about using, pick up the phone and call somebody, it's the same, like exactly like what you were talking about. It's almost like as soon as you make that phone call, it almost takes away some of that power of that thought or that urge and just getting it out there and not, not being in isolation and not holding on to that by yourself and letting someone else know that you're struggling with something that in and of itself just has power that it, it takes it away from, from that thought or that craving or that urge just to let someone else know that you're, that you're struggling. It's true. Yeah, it's 100% true. And I mean, I I think one of the things I've also learned is like shame is not the only thing that keeps us from speaking, though. Right. So, you know, sometimes sometimes what we're saying is the case. Right. You're ashamed. You're fearful of what might happen if you say it. The other another thing that could be true in that moment, too, though, is that you don't pick up the phone and make the call or shoot a text or do whatever it would take to speak it not because you're ashamed, but because you want your addiction more than you don't, right? Like, that's also true. Like, that is an all, that's also another true statement, right? Because it's tough, man. Like, breaking an addiction is hard. It is hard to do that. And we want our addiction. Our addiction is something that, you know, we've found comfort in. And it has, in some ways, been there for us in those moments. But any addict that has walked addiction long enough, I think all addicts will come to a place eventually where they realize this thing lied to me, right? Like it lied. It was the whole time. It was, it it was a trick. (laughs) Like, and it might feel good for the moment. It does meet the need immediately, but because of the bigger thing going on and how much our, our addictions draw us away from meaningful relationships with others. It costs us money. Sometimes it's going to cost us, like we get in legal trouble. I mean, there's so many things that happen in an addict's life when this thing continues to go in a bad direction. The big picture is like, it's not what it says it is. And eventually I think we come to a place where we're like, I hate you. You know, like when we speak to the addiction, like, I hate you. You promised, you lied, and now you've led me in this place of devastation or whatever the case is. I mean, everybody's story is different in terms of the consequences they faced, but I would say that shame is definitely a big piece and it needs to be dealt with. But if you don't make the phone call or don't don't move into community, sometimes that just means that you're not ready, right? You just you want the addiction more. And that's okay. I mean, it's good to be honest about that, right? Like it's, you, we're not going to get anywhere in recovery if we're live if we're trying to like kind of live this out, right? <laughs> like 
like it's not you can't kind of halfway do it you know like it's just not it's either you want it or you don't want it and if you don't want it that's okay brother sister like it's all right like you know i'm praying for you but like don't say you want it but then don't want it you know what i'm saying like it's just it's i think being honest with ourselves is a pretty key too so it's just a different aspect of those moments right sometimes we want the addiction more than we don't want it yeah, absolutely, man. So you mentioned the first two pillars. What what are uh, what are the other pillars in in this program that you're talking about? Yeah, so crushing the shame is the first one. I I, I mean that's that's anchored in my faith, right? Like I I really do believe that the shame of my addiction, which is just a way that we would say sin represents itself. Like I I think that crushing the shame is most profoundly seen in a relationship with Christ, right? After that shame is crushed, then I think it opens the door for us to cultivate true community with others because we're not trying to hide anymore and we can be open and honest. And so there's a whole process of just trying to find the right community. What are we looking for in community? Those kind of things. So shame, community. And then the third one, which, you know, in a lot of ways, dude, I think is prob- was probably the most profound part of my recovery that I think unlocked it more than anything else. I call the third pillar uncovering the unseen. And so what I mean by that is that we're peeling back the layers, right? I think addiction for the most part is like surface stuff. I know it's like, it's marquee, right? It's consequential. So, I mean, it like really like, dude, I could have gotten myself into some big trouble with sex addiction, man. I mean, and you see it on the news all the time. Watch the news. You'll see a guy getting arrested for peeping Tom or, you know, massage parlors. I mean, there's a lot of consequences when sex addiction works itself out. So I don't mean to say, I don't mean to minimize the behavior of, of addiction, but there are things like a layer, two, three, four layers deep beneath that, that we often don't see. We're just so, all we do is live in the moment of our lives. And if we can dig up the roots of the addiction, that's where I think we begin to see some like significant movement. So I'll just give you my example of the most like significant thing that I uncovered that I wasn't seeing before, right? Was that I began to see that my sex addiction, it's my sex addiction wasn't because I was just addicted to sex. Like I'm just a sex guy and I just need lots of sex. It didn't have anything really to do with that. I wasn't just a horny guy looking for some kind of sexual expression. Ultimately, I was living from this truth, and this was just kind of this is the way that I phrased it for myself. I believed deep down in my within myself that I wasn't enough, that I I wasn't good enough, I wasn't enough of whatever, however you want to kind of fill that blank in. And so because that theme was running in my heart, and then I had had these exposures to sexual brokenness, my like my the lie deep in my heart of I'm not enough attached itself to sexual acting out. And so then if I looked, if I if I really looked closely at the way that my sexual brokenness was being done, I could see how those choices, the specific ways that I was acting out sexually was connected to this, like trying to prove to myself that maybe I am enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so it's just like, so the third pillar is uncovering the unseen. I think, I think that if we pull back the curtain, I did a, a video early on when I, on my YouTube channel, video title is porn is not your problem. And so I, I'm trying to uncover these things underneath um, because I think when we pull those roots out, the tree dies, right? Like I can chop off, and I see this, dude, I, sorry, I'm a little bit off in terms of answering the, the question of the two pillars. Let me stop here for a second and say, think of it like this. Like if you've got this tree and what, let's just call it the sin tree. I know that not everybody has sin as a vocabulary, but you understand bad behavior tree, right? So if I focus on like, I just got to stop acting out sexually. Like I've got sexual sin in broken ways, like whatever I've defined that to be. And I go to the tree and I cut off the like sex sin, right? And I cut the branch off or I saw it off and it falls down. All the while I'm over here, like trying to crush this like sex sin. But on the other side of the tree, like the anger branch is growing now. 
You see what I'm saying? Like, it's like, oh crap, the anger. So you go over there and then you like try to saw off the anger. And then over here, like the greed branch grows, you know, like crap, the greed branch is going, you know, all, and then all of a sudden sex grows back. I mean, it's like going to Chuck E. Cheese and playing the whack-a-mole game. You know, it's like you crush that one. You got him. Oh crap. There's another one over there. I see the work of recovery having to include a deeper work in us, right? It's not just stopping bad behavior. That that's a willpower game, right? Like that's just a boundary setting game. And you're gonna be as good as your will is. But I think if we start healing some of those deeper things in us, whether it's like wounds from the past, I mean, you know, it's a lot of therapy talk I'm saying. I mean, I am I am a counselor, so I think in those ways, right? But I don't like just fixing the behaviors. I want for us to see something deeper in our heart, like our core beliefs what we believe about ourselves, what do we believe about others, what we believe about God, like these things really affect our behavior. So that's a deep work. It's hard to do. I mean, that's a hard do. It's hard. You can't do that without community. You know, like you can't just go up on a mountain by yourself and like just see these things. Like, I mean, maybe you can, but I, I couldn't. I needed somebody to tell me about it and talk it out with me. Right. So it, that's why it kind of builds, right? Shame, community, and then uncovering the unseen that's helpful to do in community. It's helpful to do with a counselor, a pastor, a sponsor. There's lots of people that can help you deal with those things. And then the lastly, I, I call just taking action. So once we've dealt with shame, we've got community, we, we're starting to see things in ourselves. That fourth pillar is like coming up with an action plan. And, you know, I, I think the 12-step program probably like has the market on this, right? Like they just have such a good plan. <laughs> There's 12 steps, right? I mean, lots of practicality. So that fourth pillar becomes like the practicality factor, right? What are you going to do? Like, how are we defining sobriety? What are you going to do? That's the other thing with like sex addiction, man. It's like defining sobriety with with an AA seems to be more simple, right? It's black and white. Did you drink or did you not drink? Defining sexual sobriety, like how the heck do you do that? Like, okay, did you have sex? Yes or no? Okay, that's black and white. But like, did you look at that girl for too long? Or did you lust after that guy for too long? Like, did you look twice? You know, like, it's like, it's harder to define it. So it's it's a little bit tough. I'm a Christian. So there's some particular biblical things that I might say are boundaries for sex, like sexual behavior, but it gets gray even in there, right? Anyway, so that last one is just an action plan, uh, working to try to have a plan. You execute on a plan. I love like having a plan and I love like, I, I'm a, I'm a progress over perfection guy. I don't like using the term of sobriety too much. Put that in the context of sex addiction more than um, drug addiction or alcohol addiction or something else. Like that might be a better thing in my view. I think not acting out is super important. <laughs> it's like, it is critical. However, like, you know, the, the thing for me is like not acting out, although is, is like a proper aim. Like I'm more cons I, I, what I don't like happening for people is they act out and then that keeps them from continuing to work their plan. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, because they feel so much shame, they feel so defeated and then they don't want to get back up. And that's tragic to me. So I'm like, you know, if I'm working with guys um, on, on this stuff and they're like, oh, man, you know, like I looked at porn this week. I'm like, all right, you know, cool. Like, so what are we going to do? How, what happened? Tell me. I want to know, like, where your heart was leading up to that or in the moment, because I'm more interested in what was underneath it than I am that you actually looked at porn. And then I'm also concerned to talk to you about well, what was your plan and was there a hole in the plan somewhere? You know, so we got to kind of go back to the drawing board and relook at the plan because maybe we left a place weak in a, in a spot that we need to kind of shore up and get it a little better. So, yeah, four pillars, crush the shame, cultivate community, uncover the unseen and then take action. I really like what you had to share on the third one about uncovering. I can only speak from my personal experience, but I know for me. When I stopped using drugs, then all of a sudden I found myself overeating and just trying to fill that void with food. Yes. Uh, yes. And while that's not as destructive as drug addiction, I can I started to get more unhealthy, exercise mm -hmm. less. Um, you know, it still had negative effects on my life. Mm -hmm. So I can definitely relate to what you're talking about about there being different branches, and if we're not 
addressing the root of the problem, then other negative behaviors are going to spring up while we're while we're focused like hyper focused on this one particular issue. Hundred percent, yeah. And I think I mean a controversial thought here, maybe and maybe it's not. I, I don't know. Maybe it's not as controversial as it seems to me. But I see the same thing with sobriety like and that's a part of like why i i i'm a little hesitant with the terminology like i'm i can work within it and i've used it dude i mean i i've walked down this road but i can see you know how at times you know like we trade our addiction for sobriety even right and it becomes just like that was my hardship with the 12 step experience was like i hated I just hated the focus of getting the next chip. I, I don't think that's the heart of the 12 step program, right? I don't I, like, I think if you get in it enough and you meet enough people and you talk, talk it out enough, but just kind of, if you just kind of step into the environment, it's easy to see. I mean, dude, I would say the same thing about the, the church too, at times, right? It seems like it's more about not sinning than it is about worshiping God. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So like, and I don't think that's right. I mean, the, the gospel frees us to like, gosh, man, just experience the grace of God over and over again and, and, and all of our brokenness. And I remember early on feeling like I wish that this authenticity and kind of frank vulnerability was something that I was that I could experience in my church community as well. I take ownership of that in a lot of ways, though. Like, I don't necessarily blame the church for that. I blame myself for not living that out and and maybe even just feeling like I couldn't do that. Because I'll tell you, I'm an active church member now. I've been a pastor in churches and all of this. And I've seen that kind of community in my church experience. And now that I'm living more open and vulnerable too, right? So you kind of birds of a feather flock together or something like that, right? Like, you know, you don't find vulnerable people if you're not being vulnerable right? You just kind of, you're, I'm being trapped and then I just find trapped people <laughs> and we all just kind of live fake with each other. So I think it's important for us to be careful to not trade our addiction for sobriety, like an ad addiction to drugs, addiction to alcohol, addiction to sex, addiction to gambling, whatever it is, I'm going to trade that addiction for an addiction to sobriety. It is better, right? Look, if you're going to have one or the other, let's choose sobriety. <laughs> like, like, that's great. You're not necessarily growing in character, though, right? Like, you might not be doing bad things, but if you're still an addict and now sobriety is your hit, there's still something in that, right? There's something in there that doesn't quite, that just doesn't quite come off. Like, I, you know, it's still a prideful person. It's still a hard, potentially hardened person. I don't know how to decide if you're addicted to sobriety or not, but, you know, I just, I want for people to experience real freedom and joy. And so if you're, if you're always paranoid and worried about the sobriety piece, maybe you're still missing something. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that, man. You can definitely trade one for another. And, and I think that an addiction is anything I think it can be anything that you do in excess that affects other areas of your life in a, in a negative way. And, and so if you're like you were talking about, if you're there just trying to get that next chip or whatever, you can definitely let that rule your life. And, you know, you can be missing important stuff with your family and your friends and, uh, you know, just become all consumed with whatever it is. Yeah. And that, and it does. Right. And that, it becomes your God, if you will. Right. And that's, I think ultimately I, Mike Wilkerson was a pastor, a pastor of mine in the past. I, I love the way he, he kind of talks about recovery in this, in this quote, he wrote a book called redemption. And early in that book, he says about our place of addiction. So, you know, here we are, we're in this mess of our addiction, right? He says, we worshiped our way into this mess now we're going to worship our way out of it. I mean, worship may be a foreign term to some of the people listening, maybe not. But what he means by that is that our addiction is doing something for us, right? So we we run to it. We give our time, our energy, our forethought, our money. Our, I mean, we give our lives for this addiction, 
that is what the church calls worship, <laughs> right? So we worshiped our heart led us towards the addiction because the addiction said, if you worship me, I will pay you back in this way, right? And so we, our heart was like, let's go. We're, we're going to do this. We're worshiping, worshiping, worshiping. So he says, look, you worshiped your way into this mess. You, you might not have realized that, but you worshiped your way here. Now the solution is to just change your worship. And so, you know, in the 12 step program, we talk about, you know, higher power or whatever the case is, but that is what we're aiming at. That's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying, we're going to say, I'm going to stop worshiping alcohol or sex or drugs, whatever. And now instead I'm going to worship God. But sometimes what we end up doing is we end up worshiping sobriety, right? So then it's like, that becomes our new God. And while again, what's a better God, sobriety or, or drugs? Well, I mean, it depends on what your view is, right? Because like that, the Pharisees in the Bible were the most religious people, but Jesus had the harshest words for them. He was actually much kinder, um, much more welcoming to the ones that were like live clearly living in sin. <laughs> but the ones that were like, you know, hey, I pray every day and, I, you know, I give all my money to this. And it was like they were really prideful about their righteousness or their rightness or their what we, what we might say their sobriety. But Jesus actually had harsher words for them because they were so prideful in their own, I can do it, right? And I think that's, I think that's one of the heartbeats of, of recovery is realizing you can't. <laughs> like, like, I can't do this. I need help. I need help, right? You know, I, I do realize, again, I, I don't want to misspeak here. I would rather not be addicted to porn than be addicted to porn. You know, if I had to choose between the two, it makes sense that out of a love of neighbor and love for myself, I would choose to be addicted to not looking at porn instead of looking at porn. But I don't know that either one of them are the true solution. I think there's a there's a truer solution. And I think that's where, you know, for me, the worship of God in Christ is where that goes, right? So like, I just, I want to worship him it's all about him, not about me though. Do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share? Yeah, dude. I, I mean, first I would say is like, just thank you. It's a, it's a honor, dude. It's an honor for you to have reached out to me and invited me to be here. So I'm super humble and super grateful. I'm passionate about these things, but I'm also teachable. <laughs> so, you know, I don't think I've figured this stuff out, man. It's just, I'm trying to give my story to whoever it will help. Right. And so, if I can help you, anyone, you know, if I can help someone, I want to help. If I'm not helpful, I don't, you know, maybe I look funny or talk funny or don't have the right perspective that's going to be helpful, then there's going to be somebody else that's going to help. But if I can help, I'd love to just offer to anyone that's listening, you know, of, of the people that tune into your podcast, my checklist guide, the four pillars of a porn free life. It's on the website, sexaddictedchristian.com. And right there on the front, you can just click the button and download it. It's a free gift for any of you guys that this would be helpful. It's not gender specific. So guys or girls can connect to that. And uh, yeah, I just would love to give that to them. You know, my blog's on there. So I've got a lot of different videos covering different aspects of sex addiction. Um, so if any of that's helpful, any you can email me at jimmy at sexaddictedchristian.com. Be happy to interact with anyone if anybody's got questions. But overall, man, I just appreciate you giving me some time to chat and talk about my story. And yeah, man, I'm excited for what you're up to here. Uh, I appreciate it, man. One of my good friends in recovery says, you know, I'm just a beggar telling another beggar where I found some bread, man. Like all I can do is, <laughs> is share what I've found. Uh, and it sounds like you're doing the same thing. And I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate your transparency and talking with us about some of these issues that there's still a stigma about and there's still a lot of shame and guilt. And I think a lot of people are scared to talk about sex addiction, masturbation, those kind of things. So I really appreciate you taking time and, and letting us know about your journey and, and what you're doing to help people that are struggling in those same areas as you. Yeah, my pleasure, bro. Jimmy, thank you for sharing with us. I really love what you're doing. 
The link for his website will be in the show notes where you can grab that free guide that he was talking about, as well as a link to his YouTube and Instagram page. You've been listening to Recovery Survey. If you got anything out of today's episode, I'd ask you to please leave us a five-star review and share this episode with a friend. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can find us at recoverysurvey.com. You can listen to all of our episodes on the website as well as connect with us on social media where you can get previews for upcoming episodes. So you love podcasts and you want to listen to more amazing content, but you have no idea what to listen to. And your friends keep telling you about great episodes, yet you can never remember what they told you. Well, here's the answer. Good Pods. It's the social app dedicated to podcasts where your friends, podcast listeners, and favorite podcast hosts all come together to share on their feeds what they recommend and what they listen to. You can connect to others, bookmark episodes, start a conversation about the episode, connect to the hosts, and most importantly, listen to great podcasts right in the Good Pods app. Download Good Pods wherever you get your apps and start sharing with a community that loves to listen. Good Pods, it's where to connect and listen.